Logo depois que termina a chamada Primavera Árabe, dois movimentos de rua muito fortes surgem, um no Brasil e um na Turquia. No Brasil, a popularidade da presidente Dilma, que era de 80%, caiu para menos de 30%. Na Turquia, acabou num, numa tentativa de golpe militar contra o presidente Erdogan. E no Brasil, acabou num golpe. O senhor vê relação entre as duas coisas, Turquia e Brasil, eh, sendo induzidas por uma força exterior? Não entre a Turquia e o Brasil. Acho que eles são... They are different. Uh, uh, maybe in the in the counter coup in Brazil uh, was populist in nature. Uh, if there's a, a broader question on uh, use of social media, which on the one hand is uh, permitting um, a non-industrialized culture to emerge organically, unpredictably, uncontrollably, um, permitting uh, political leaders to eclipse the middle and speak directly uh, to the mass, as Erdogan is doing as a Trump. Doing. Um, that is cutting out the censorship uh, and influence of organized mediums owned by the big families, um, the big media uh, conglomerates. Um, and then that effect is, having been seen, uh, is being addressed by organizations that specialize on setting up hundreds or thousands of robots uh, on the internet to push a particular message, to make it appear that it is an organic phenomenon, but actually is a programmed phenomenon. I give you an example in uh, Bahrain in 2011. Sim. We published a lot of information about Bahrain. Uh, it was at the time of the Arab Spring and the Bahrainis Uh, rose up, at least the Sh Shiite Bahrainis, who are the majority of the population. Um, and they are very popular uh, on Twitter. Uh, and then within about a year, uh, the Bahraini regime uh, had uh, hired a number, uh, I've seen the, the number put at 10 uh, different PR companies, and mostly Western PR companies. <coughs> Um, and suddenly there were you know, many Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts and even uh, websites posting uh, pro-regime propaganda and spreading it. In Brazil it was a bit different because since the left was in power, these populist right-wing sure. messages were uh, somehow supported by the mainstream media, media which is owned only by five families. And what we saw in 2013 was quite different from what has happened in Brazilian history, which is the emergence of a uh, right wing, which is not afraid of saying they're right wing, and quite xenophobic and leftophobic, which is a new phenomenon in Brazil, as if imported from the United States in a sense. And well, well ge genuine, mm -hmm. uh, genuine populism si. always can be moved against authority, uh, where there's a medium that can express it because uh, authority is perceived by its ability to arrest people, tax people, and to lead in that respect. Uh, and when uh, free criticism can flourish of the harshest type, uh, it, undermines the it undermines the perception of authority. So that is something that happened in Dilma's case that wasn't purely organic, there's an organic component. Another component was pushed by these five media companies and probably by uh, robots. Actually, I have seen evidence of, ro 
also pushed by robots. Uh, uh, I'm not sure who controlled them, if that was discovered in the end, but also pushed by social media robots. Yeah, it's... it's um, we, we are just at the very beginning of this phenomenon, right, where um, many people now have the ability to publish. Okay, so that changes the, the power dynamic because our existing societies, a lot of their power dynamic is based upon censorship, hmm? preventing the majority of the population being able to publish, um, or at least uh, publish in a way that spreads to many people. That is starting to change. Do you know whether you are dealing with a, a robot? Do you know whether you're dealing with a genuine person, or is it um, some system that uh, has some human beings in it, and each human being controls a thousand robots, and that's what you're actually interacting with. So. So it's the invention of a of a fake demos. The, so why do revolutions happen in squares very frequently? The, the Winter Palace, you know, shipyards, or Tarhir Square. Why do they always happen in squares? Um, it's because in a square you can see what the popular will is. You look around, you can see the see the people. Why do you need a square to do that? Surely, if the people were not in the square and the media was fairly reporting what the popular will was, you would have the revolution anyway. Well, it's because the communications channel don't report what the popular will is. So you don't have that same perception. It is the perception of what the majority will is that defines whether something is politically possible. So when there's a revolution, uh, it is often in a square, like Tahrir Square or the Winter Palace, because people can see that they have the numbers. Uh, why don't they see that they have the numbers when they're not in the square? Uh, because the media system uh, is suppressing the reality of what people think, and so they cannot perceive the demos. So now we must enter into a with, with everyone being able to speak on the internet in one way or another, the antidote to this is to uh, create a fake demos. Hmm? Not to, it's becoming, it's too simple just to censor people. Uh, it becomes too hard. Who, who, you're not worried ultimately as a political power whether you're censoring people. What you're worried about is uh, the perception that you have the numbers that you have the popular will behind you so to achieve that effect you can create a fake demos uh, and that's what's um, since about 2011 uh, where uh, states and political parties uh, uh, have been moving towards this is a new type of manufacturing of consent uh, we're familiar with the old type which is the big media oligarchs uh, but once you have social media, you need a new type of manufacturing consent. And, and that is to manufacture the appearance of a democratic will. O senhor vê, viu, se pode identificar a mão dos Estados Unidos nas manifestações de rua do Brasil? I have seen that there are a number of robots used uh, online to help stimulate those protests. Uh, but looking at what US programs are, uh, you know, such things don't happen in Latin America without uh, the U.S. supporting uh, financially, logistically, through intelligence, either at the moment or uh, the players uh, that come together. That's uh, yeah. If you read our publications, you'll see that happens again and again and again. And and Brazil is a country that is of intense interest. In fact. Um, if you look at the amount of it spying on different uh, Latin American countries and other countries, and it is the country in Latin America with the most uh, spying by the United States. Uh, and, that's, and that's very interesting because you, naively you would say uh, it must be 
Venezuela or Cuba? Because these historically have seemed the most adversarial uh, publicly si. to the United States. Si. No, no, it is Brazil. No. Why is it Brazil? Brazil has a bigger economy. That's a, that's a, Brazil's simply more economically Brazil. important. And that's one of the factors in the economy. Agora no Brasil, um jovenzinho de 16 anos, 17 anos, disse que fraudou uma eleição no, no, no município pequeno no trajeto entre a saída do voto, da máquina de votar, até o tribunal, que o hacker entra e pode mudar. Tudo isso para dizer para o senhor o seguinte, perguntar para o senhor o seguinte, o senhor acredita que a, a, a democracia como nós conhecemos pode ser fraudada pela internet? I was a teenage computer hacker uh, and then became a security consultant and a cryptographic engineer. So I use that knowledge to keep WikiLeaks and our sources safe. We exist within a community uh, of similar people. Um, for a long time, I and others in that community for 20 years uh, have said that electronic voting machines are dangerous. Okay. The manufacturers will argue, uh, no, they're, they're not dangerous. In fact, they increase the accuracy of the vote because it is harder to tamper with a complex machine uh, <coughs> than it is for a simple ballot box. Okay. The, the issue is this. Yes, it's true. It is harder to tamper with a complex machine than a simple ballot box. But when you tamper with a simple ballot box, you affect how many votes? Maybe a few hundred. Uh, when you tamper with the code that runs these machines or the computer that they report back to, uh, you can uh, affect hundreds of thousands or millions of votes and you can do it in a way that is almost completely undetectable. So that's the basic problem. And you go, okay, but fine, we can have auditors. They can audit these machines and look inside them and check that they're all okay, etc. We can have two lots of auditors, etc. The reality is governments like to cut costs and auditors get lazy. So over time, the auditing decreases. This is a, um, a very interesting philosophical problem which is any machine which is very complex, uh, almost no one can determine that it is doing what it is claimed to be doing. Uh, so uh, for something like voting, which has uh, such, is an intense quest for power ultimately, where the, the motivations are very uh, strong, um, uh, the average person needs to be able to see that it is doing what it is claimed to do. And nothing that is complex, the average person can understand that it is doing what it's meant to do. And this is why electronic voting machines are dangerous. In the auge of the Guerra Fria, the cardinal húngaro Joseph Mizzetti passou 15 years dentro da embaixada dos Estados Unidos em Budapeste, porque estava sendo perseguido pelo, pelo governo eh, pró-soviético. O senhor está preparado para viver aqui na embaixada do Equador? O senhor já está aqui há quatro anos. O senhor está preparado para viver aqui na embaixada do Equador por quanto tempo? It's not relevant about how long I'm prepared to stay. The question is, will the United States obey its own laws and drop uh, its uh, attempted prosecution against me and potentially against other members of WikiLeaks as well. That's a, when will the US Department of Justice obey the law? Its own laws, the US Constitution, the First Amendment, even its internal regulation that it shouldn't be uh, prosecuting publishers. Then there's a question, when will the United Kingdom and Sweden obey the law? Uh, the United Nations uh, found on the 5th of February this year that both were acting illegally to keep me here uh, in this embassy through threat of arrest. Um, 
um, detaining me effectively without charge uh, in this country for six years. So when will they obey the law? Uh, recently, the United Nations reaffirmed that decision and said, we looked into it again, and the situation is still ongoing and it is still illegal. When will they obey the law? I find it very ironic that you have uh, a publisher, WikiLeaks, uh, which is accused uh, of being radical uh, and revolutionary. And, and what does this publisher say? Uh, people should obey the law, not, <laughs> not act uh, corruptly, be honest, uh, be open, be transparent. It, it is uh, in some ways so uh, simple and uh, uh, Christian, even, even conservative, um, this vision. Uh, and we say um, that these states should just obey their own laws. It's, it's, not, so, it's not such a strong demand. Uh, and what do those people who oppose us say? Uh, even though uh, the law says that you can publish this. No, 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 you mustn't. We will corrupt uh, our judicial institutions. We will apply a strong pressure on them. We will not obey uh, our human rights obligations, our treaty obligations, uh, the courts that we've signed up to in the United Nations. Uh, we will not obey any of these things that we promised uh, that we do. These so-called uh, conservative states. So WikiLeaks is a conservative institution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Espero recebê-lo no Brasil em liberdade e no Brasil democrático. Muito obrigado. Thanks.